All right. So want to once again want to welcome everybody here today. And um we will this should take probably under an hour for us to go through everything. And so our agenda is we'll go over IAM events, upcoming IAM events first, and then we'll cover grouper, shibboleth, and SAML MCM, CAS, and then midpoint we'll finalize with midpoint. So go ahead, get started first with the IAM events, and we'll have Mike Brady present those. Hello, uh, Mike Grady. I am architect with Unicon. The uh, the first uh, upcoming event that uh, has a you know fairly significant identity and access management component to it, of course, is Educause. That annual conference is coming up in a, a couple of weeks uh, in person, but then there's also a online only component that's uh, in kind of the middle of November there, and you can see those dates. Uh, I imagine if you're going to that, you you're or doing either one, you're either you're already registered and have all your plans in place for those. Um, then at uh, the end of the year in uh, in December uh, is the Internet to Technology Exchange for uh, 2024, and that's in Boston, um, and that's uh, one that uh, Unicon always has a pretty well. We have pretty significant presence at both EdgeCause and uh, at TechX. Um, you know, definitely in, if you, you know, for in common and identity broadly in higher education, probably the most, you know, the, the best technical conference there is around IAM. Um, there's the in common academy courses, which now nowadays take place all online. Um, and there is a, you know, overall calendar. That's probably the best place to keep track of what's coming up is that link there for the overall calendar. Uh, in particular, there's a two-parter uh, for Midpoint that um, uh, deployment uh, first steps and then um, deployment group synchronization, uh, where that first steps one is considered a prereq for that second one. So you're not intended to just sign up for the group synchronization one, but, but attend that first steps one first. Um, and then there's a currently scheduled mid-November uh, grouper training class. Uh, coming up, but you can sort of keep track on the ongoing schedule of of training opportunities by by keeping track on that uh, at that link and and or subscribing to the right mailing list to get notifications uh, of when those classes are are going to be scheduled. Want to go to the next slide? Uh, and then for 2025, we have the second of the two yearly Internet Two meetings, Community Exchange. Tends to be at a little more of a, an exact CIO, C star sort of a level, but there certainly is a technical, some technical component to it. That's going to be at the end of April in Anaheim. Um, there's also uh, the continuing series of the IAM online uh, webinars, uh, and that's the link for information on that. And the other thing to keep in mind is all of those are recorded, so you can always, if you miss one, you can always go back and and see the content. The latest one was on um, pass keys and uh, passwordless authentication, uh, one that was just held uh, several weeks ago. Um, there's a kind of a calendar of everything happening for Internet 2 uh, upcoming events calendar, another good place to check in on occasionally to see what's coming up. Uh, another opportunity for those of you who are members of In Common, and particularly if you are using uh, you know, key aspects of the, the uh, Trusted Access platform or considering doing so, is the the broader uh, CSP, Collaboration Success Program, which has cohorts, uh, yearly cohorts, uh, and there's a way now that you can put your name in as being interested in potentially taking part in the 20, the cohort that will start off in uh, late spring, summer of 2025. Um, so that's another uh, opportunity to consider. And finally, if you're interested in kind of big picture, broad commercial, latest ideas around protocols and authentication and identity, 
all the big commercial players, uh, all of the folks doing, you know, maybe cutting edge stuff and wallets and passwordless and FIDO and that sort of thing. The best thing that I found for keeping track of what those events are uh, is uh, ID Pro, which is, you know, an organization founded a few years ago to try to come up with some uh, you know, start establishing more standards for being an identity pr a professional, coming up with tests and potentially, you know, potentially qualifying uh, certificates and that in the identity and access management space. But they keep an events calendar at that link there that, you know, will show you when the, the IIW Internet Identity Workshop, Identifers, those really big uh, uh, conferences on all things identity um uh, are happening so that that's 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 the best source i found for one place to go to to see what all those potential opportunities are all right thank you mike uh, one additional thing i wanted to mention if you have any questions at all during the webinar just go ahead and enter those in the chat and our staff will try and pick those up and answer those as we go through the the presentation so our first presentation will be on Grouper and Chad Redman will be doing the presentation. Hello everyone, Chad Redman here, and I'm gonna be talking about Grouper for a few minutes and letting you know what, what is the latest status of the, the uh, software and the, the project. Um, so there are two, currently two active branches that are being released. Uh, version four is Unofficially, it's it's referred to as the stable branch. Officially, it's called the non-enhancement branch, uh, meaning there could could be um, changes and new features, but uh, less risky uh, changes. Um, that's the ideal, anyway. <laughs> um, so the current release is 4.15.4, and that's as of two days ago. So it's probably not even stamped with the stable release, which just means a few people have tried it and haven't caused any problems. So um, this is just um, showing what the latest latest version is up to date. Um, as of a few months ago, it's using Rocky Linux 9 and Tomcat 9. So supported and secure secure versions of, of those uh, software components. Uh, the latest changes since our last um, update, um, they're continuing to make improvements to the provisioner, um, synchronization, bug fixes, things like that. Uh, one major change is uh, you can now provision Google and Azure, and uh, I think AWS also, you and maybe some other provisioners, user roles. So not just members in groups, but you can also add owners and managers to groups where um, those are applicable. Uh, the skim provisioner also provides more targets. Originally, it was just AWS and GitHub, and I I think they've modified it to be a little more flexible and uh, work with more targets. Uh, there's built-in Swagger documentation for web services. So if the wiki pages for the, the REST APIs aren't working for you, here's an alternate source of documentation for that. Uh, they've also swapped out the JSON library for various internal functions, but also if you're using JSON uh, libraries for your own um, code that you've you've custom written, uh, they swapped that out, and they've they're now using a much faster library. Uh, in my experience, um, in the order of fifteen to twenty times faster. So significant improvements there. Uh, <clears throat> uh, next slide. All right, Grouper version five. So this is the the uh, more experimental branch uh there are more major changes in this um it's actively being developed uh, a few customers are using this but not many most people are still on version four uh the current release is 5.13.0 and and again this is as of, of probably two or three days ago um, the focus on Grouper version 5 is on scripted groups and attribute-based access control. Whereas in, in version 4, you had basis groups and reference groups and built up composites and uh, composition to build your access policies. Now you have an alternate way of doing that, which is you can, you can, uh, 
You can source uh, attributes on your subjects and groups uh, in, in uh, various data caching tables, and you can write queries to come up with more complex ways of mixing and matching those, those groups and attributes to come up with your access policies. So a lot more power um, in that, and also it eliminates the need for having a lot of basis groups um, that may or may not be uh, in, in large use, so it simplifies that. Uh, it also contains all of the version four updates that I talked about on the last slide. Um, now it is an experimental branch, so make sure you, you test extensively. Um, there are, so among these, these major changes, some things have been deprecated and some things have been re, uh, removed. Most significantly, it doesn't have the Apache web server and it doesn't have the Shibboleth service provider anymore. Uh, which means if you want to do SSO, you need to find an alternate way of doing that. So one way you can do that is just build your image with the Shibboleth SP and Apache put back in there. So that's a valid option. Uh, Grouper does have built-in OIDC if your um, SSO provider can handle that. Or there is also Pack4j, which is a, uh, in, uh, a, a plugin jar file that can do uh, that can serve as a service provider without being an external process. So this runs within the grouper process. Um, with the new provisioning framework, all the legacy provisioners have been removed. So that includes the, the custom Azure provisioner, the custom uh, Google provisioner, et cetera, et cetera. And PSPNG, which was deprecated in version four, but now is uh, completely gone. So if you're using that and you want to switch to version five, start looking for migrating that to the new provisioner. Um, legacy SQL and LDAP subject sources, which uh, a lot of you are probably using, those have been deprecated. Uh, that really means nothing. Nothing is, has changed or broken with version five, but to look at forward on version six and seven, um, start thinking about migrating those. Uh, next slide. Uh, two security notices to note. One is, is not affecting many people. So there was a, a vulnerability with LDAP authentication to web services. Um, the people that this affected, you would need to have LDAP work with authenticating with just a username and no password, which affects very few people. You would have to try really hard to get that kind of setting. So, um, but it was a vulnerability that people should have been aware of. Um, a more major one, which um, was, was uh, from a year ago, uh, basic authentication. Um, and this, this affected versions uh, up to version 4.8 and 5.5. So if you're on those vulnerable versions, there was some mitigation, uh, which you can read about in the Grouper Security Issues Wiki page, uh, but also upgrading will fix those issues. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Grouper Roadmap, uh, so in version five, continuing to work on uh, the data fields and attribute-based access control, which I mentioned. So that's the data fields that are coming from the subject sources. Uh, library updates, which have not been started yet, and a user interface for uh, rules so that you don't need to manage that through attributes anymore. Uh, that I believe is complete and it works very nicely. So if you're on version five, be sure to try that out. Uh, looking forward to version seven, which I don't know when that uh, work will start, but what they're looking at is removing legacy subject sources, uh, bulk operations performance, so batching um, uh, database lookups and things like that, um, database optimization and performance diagnostics. Uh, next page. Uh, some sustaining engineering projects that we've been working on. Uh, the major one is the the Pack4j plugin, uh, which we released and um, is out there to download and add on to your uh, grouper image if you need an external uh, service provider. So this provides authentication to the U UI. Um, I should add, it also can authenticate to web services. Um, this has multiple methods, SAML, OIDC and CAS, so a little bit more flexibility than the Shibboleth SP had. Um, and another thing, this is this is more minor, but improvements to the DMN UI pages. Um, you can open up uh, 
uh, jobs, demon jobs and new tabs, uh, the navigation of it, the the filters and things is a little bit nicer. I, I appreciate it anyway. Uh, next page. Is there any more? Okay. That's it. Thank you all. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Chad. Next, we'll go to Shibboleth along with some information on SAML MCM. Um, Mark McCoy will be doing Shibboleth and Sean Poor will be talking about SAML MCM. Good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to talk about uh, Shibboleth. And so the current um, or the previous, excuse me, version of Shibboleth was uh, IDP4. And uh, that is now gone end of life as of September 1st. So if you're running IDP4, obviously we want to make sure that everyone's uh, getting uh, migrated up to five. Um, the last version is 4.3.3. That will be the last release. No future uh, bug fixes or security fixes will be coming out. Um, as long as you're following their upgrade path, which is to make sure that you get onto the latest version of four, which would be 4.3.3, uh, that's a really good prep or then the migration to five, because one of the things the upgrade path does does have is uh, all of the changes or most of the changes that you'll need to make to get to five should be listed in the in the logs with deprecation warnings. So, uh, you know, as long as you're resolving all of those deprecation warnings uh, in four three, uh, then you should be ready to go ahead and and go ahead with the upgrade to five. And so make sure that um, you know as you're working through that process. Uh, all those those deprecations are, are covered, and then you should be good to go ahead and go to five. Uh, next slide. And so uh, the current version of five is uh, five one three, which was released uh, this July. Um, the the whole migration from four to five, um, one of the the big impetuses was to do a big refactor of the code base for five, um, which is why. Um, some of the interfaces, some of the libraries, they change, the underlying libraries change. Uh, the, the bare minimum now is to use Java 17. Uh, the Spring framework was upgraded to six internally, um, which then required, requires us to uh, go through our code, look for any, any instances where we're using some of the older library paths, uh, and then change those references within the Java code. Um, for example, the the there were some references to some older Java X libraries that are now part of the J J Jakarta uh, libraries. So we have to make those, those changes appropriately. Uh, the bare um, minimum for running the, the service is going to be on JD11 or Tomcat 10.1. And that also requires the Java 17. Um, and as part of that upgrade, if you're using one of the earlier versions of 4 that has the built-in Duo um, modules, that you will need to look at migrating also to the Duo OIDC plugin. That's going to be a, another change to look for. Uh, that th Those modules no longer exist in 5, and they've been replaced by that Duo OIDC plugin, which you've probably already done as part of getting off of the legacy Duo um, interface anyway. But it's just a, we wanted to make sure we pointed that out just because that is another change that, that's going to happen as part of that upgrade. Uh, and of course, there is a very detailed um, uh, example instead of documentation uh, on that the wiki page for SHIB for, for doing that, walking through that upgrade, making sure you cover all of those different steps. Uh, next slide. On the service provider side, uh, current version is still 3.4.1. Um, there's been some minor patches released on the Windows side um, for packaging and some libraries that needed to get upgraded, but 3.4.1 is still the, the major version um, for a while now. Uh, essentially, there's only going to be security patches going forward if needed. Um, there was an open SSL vulnerability last year, but it was not really considered to have an impact. Uh, but they went ahead and upgraded those libraries internally just out of caution. So uh, that's an example of, even though it, the, the project itself has gone into a, pretty much a maintenance mode for three, uh, they are still looking at, you know, obviously security concerns. Um, the upgrade from SHIB uh, SP3 to four, that's still in kind of a design phase. They did the major work over the last two years to get all of the V5, the IDP libraries for V5 refactored so that then they can use uh, a lot of the underlying code both on the IDP side and the SP side instead of it being two separate projects. So that's, uh, if you're interested in kind of the current state of, of the discussions, they do put a lot of their discussions out there uh, linked to it on that uh, that redesign page there. Uh, but as far as a timeline on for, for, you know, where we are or where they are with uh, providing version four, 
Uh, we we don't don't have an update on that yet. That's that they they haven't you know, really seen any information on that yet. It's still ongoing work. So uh, next slide. And so one of the things that we wanted to bring up uh, as part of the shibboleth discussion, it does have a, an effect on on cast as well. Uh, but we figured we're going to be talking about both of those today. Uh, is that in common, um, which provides obviously the the metadata for you know many of the in common services. Uh, they are going to be retiring their legacy endpoint where you can download the big aggregate metadata with literally thousands upon thousands of service providers and identity providers. Uh, and so um, they've been rec recommending and Unicon's been recommending that people switch to the metadata query service uh, for, for years now. It's a very, been a very stable uh, service. Um, and that allows you to, instead of downloading a huge file once a day and loading it all into memory and having to have the memory overhead of having to, to keep all of those thousands of, of SPs or IDPs in memory that you're not ever going to use, most likely, uh, is doing a more on-demand environment, where as your users are using your, your identity provider or your service provider, it will pull in uh, that metadata kind of on the fly, on demand for you. And so the the legacy metadata endpoint, the md.incoma.org, is going to go away in January, uh, but you can still get the aggregate metadata if you if you if you still want to kind of continue with that method. You'll have to change some endpoints in your, your config. You have to make sure you download the new signing key because that the signing key is is tied to that endpoint. Um, and there's a link in there where it's just still available that you can use to uh, kind of get the information to to continue using the aggr aggregate but switch to the endpoint. Uh, if you're interested in actually converting to the MDQ service, uh, which we recommend, uh, there's links for there's there's um, instructions on a variety of, of different entity and service providing software. But uh, we put the links to obviously the the uh, three ones the three uh, that we're most interested in here or most concerned about here, which is obviously uh, Shibboleth IDP or SP, and then uh, CAS and how to convert over to that MDQ service. And then for a general overview and more information about the MDQ service itself, uh, there's also a link to that here on the slide. Uh, next slide. And I'll turn it over to Sean. All right, thank you. So the SAML Metadata Configuration Manager, that's its official new name. Um, not much has changed as far as its functionality. That's pretty much all where it's at. Version 1.18 is the current, uh, but there is a version 2 has been actually finished and it just hasn't been officially released because uh, we're still working on some uh, deployment integration specific bugs and also the i2 Docker image has to uh, get some updates that they're currently working on. So, you know, if you did want to try out version 2, the war file is available. Uh, and basically, it is exactly the same as 1.18. It's just it works with Java 17 now. Uh, we also updated a bunch of the documentation. Uh, the deployment examples are a little more filled out. Uh, we've gotten a couple new use cases in there. And we've also completely redid the user guide. That also has a lot more use cases. And uh, I think it's just in review, but it should be released on the wiki pretty shortly. Other than that, we're still you know, working on it, going to get these bugs out. And then uh, hopefully we'll release the official version two and then start from there. Uh, as always, if you do need assistance, you can uh, send an email to help at InCommon and ask to get asked to the Slack channel. Uh, that's for most of the people who are using it, are asking questions, and we're also there, too, to help. And uh, that's it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Sean. We're now be moving to CAS, and Andrew Tillinghast will be our presenter. Good afternoon. Um, just updates on where we are with CAS. Currently, the CAS is running 7.1.1. Uh, version six has been fully uh, end of life. Um, they are now working on uh, CAS seven two, um, which will be running JDK twenty one. Um, version seven dot zero dot X will have an end of life in April of twenty twenty four. 
Next slide. Uh, some of the things that are major features is CAS 7.2. Uh, we've been moving to JDK 21, Spring Boot 3.4, uh, more Growl VM recipes, which will help with deploying uh, in different containers. Uh, Jagger distributed tracing for better logging. Next slide. Uh, added a Redis ticket registry and Apache uh, Kafka ticket registries. And you can find the full notes online uh, at, the, at the link from Apparel. Next slide. Uh, some of the other things they're working on with 7.2, um, improved TGT delegation, um, allowed reduction of OAuth 2 scopes, Part for um, friendly capture when recapture. Um, Max cookie age can now be configured, and there's going to be much more that they're adding for 7.2. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And now for Midpoint, and Paul Spouty will be presenting. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Paul Spouty. I am an uh, architect, engineer, whatever, jack of all trades here. Uh, Midpoint is an identity and access management program, um, kind of newer to the ITAP suite, but been around for a while now. Uh, lots of deployments out there and uh, lots of good things happening. Uh, largely, this uh, the look here and some of the features I'm going to go through, um, not much has changed. Midpoint changed to a one once a year release cycle. Uh, so there are long-term supported releases and there are stable or feature style releases that, um, that get pushed out uh, every year. So we're due for another one here in the end of October or November um, from Evolving, which is called Midpoint 4.9. Continuing the trend of the 4.9 or 4X series, I guess, every release seems to contain goodies for higher education. So I have a lot of interest about people jumping to that 4.9. One of the biggest things, and I'll talk about uh, once 4.9 is released, we'll do a briefing. Uh, this briefing will update you on some of the features. But one of the features that I know is coming um, that um, perhaps many have been asking for is you can actually edit schema extension. So when you extend the user schema, for example, and add a new field such as birth date or my custom educational ID, whatever you want to add to attributes, you can do that now from the GUI. Um, it's it's a first it's a first step. They said they're going to enhance it even more, um, but it, it looks pretty cool in the demos that I've seen. Uh, you are able to actually uh, utilize or play with 4.9. Uh, the branch and stuff is out there. It's just not out for a full release just yet. So the current uh, releases are 4.7 is the latest feature release, but that actually predates the latest LTS release, which is 4.84. Uh, I believe there's a couple of point releases coming out on those as well. Um, so so just keep up to date. Uh, but 4.8.4 is the latest uh, long-term stable release, and the dates are there uh, for their support windows. Uh, keep in mind that while Evolvium supports the midpoint to 10, 17, 28, uh, 2028, we will uh, support you on whatever version you're on as best we can. So, for example, a security vulnerability comes out. Um, that's one where we will see if we can backport it to the version you're on if Evolvium doesn't do it for you. And uh, if we can't, then that's something to consider, but we will still support you uh, on that. Uh, next slide. So the since midpoint 4.8 is the latest release, um, basically, uh, I had to update these slides because they're about the same as last time. So, but Let's talk about what as a whole in 4.8 is are the greatest benefits. Uh, should you not be on this version or should you be considering midpoint uh, that you want to look at? And largely, there are a lot of GUI improvements. Um, so previous versions of midpoint you might be familiar with or seen some demos. Go check it out again and then you can ask for a demo from us. We'll give you one uh, because a lot of the there's a lot of improvements to make things nicer and easier to use such that it's getting rare, especially with resources that you hardly have to ever touch XML, uh, which is really nice. Um, a lot of the features post 4.8, so now we're talking about 4.9 in the future, 
uh, deal with roles and entitlements and that sort of thing. And so there's a lot of good things coming to midpoint, but a lot of UI updates and those are going to continue. Um, IJ improvements are those role improvements I just talked about. One of the biggest features, um, I think, that not a lot of other uh, software out there has. Some are starting to adopt this feature, but uh, Volvium Midpoint is, they believe, is one of the first ones with it in a, in a nice manner, has been simulations. So what does that mean? Uh, simulations are a way to simulate doing something on the resource before you actually do it and, and make the change and blow things up, right? Um, so you can set the whole resource into simulation. You can set certain mappings. A uh, big challenge is having dev in production, right? Well, sometimes you just can't have a dev or test version of that resource. You can actually have uh, simulator dev mappings and production mappings so that you can simulate what would happen with your new mappings without actually having it happen. Uh, we've used this feature now quite a bit. Um, import preview and others like so before you import an identity from a new resource you just looked up you can see what will happen and check your assumptions when you mapped some of the data um, and it'll even run a whole task with simulations and you can view the report when you're done um, I will say this I have a, a client with a million two hundred thousand identities that was kind of rough to look through <laughs> but for shorter shorter examples or if you filter it down uh, you can do that so simulations are a big thing. And then there's security and performance improvements. SSO is really good. Um, a, a lot of just nice, nice niceties. There's um, OpenID Connect is now a, uh, available in the flexible authentication and just adding to it and enhance. So a lot of new things. Next slide. Um, so there also is smart correlation uh, enhancements. And I'd say there's not a lot of new features there, um, but one of the features is just making it easier to use. It's becoming a lot more widely utilized. And these are using some built-in Postgres features similar to like Banner, you might be familiar with Oracle, of fuzzy matching, of putting weights on things. Um, there's a lot of cool things that Midpoint gives you. And there's a dispute process. So if let's say you wanna match people and normally you'd have to match by an identifier or two with a lot of other systems, right? Email address or or uh, an identity ID or some 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 form like that. Well, smart correlation gives you the ability to, to match on a, a variety of, of attributes and you can make up your own rules and put weights on them. So first name, last name, birth date, for example, first name, last name, birth date, last for the SSN or all of the SSN, whatever you want to do, hash. Uh, there's so many things. And the dispute process is a lot easier now. So if you find one that, you know, let's say first name, last name, birth date, where that's not a surety because the, the SSN or maybe that wasn't there, didn't match, something like that, you go into the dispute. And then you're able to cor correlate. You, uh, an administrator can click on the record and say, I want to correlate this identity going forward, that these two are the same. Or maybe they're different, right? And I want Midpoint to split them up, add the, add the new identity for that, that user that has the same first name, last name, and birth date, and continue on. Even though you didn't have all the information traditionally to make that decision, you can, again, delegate it off to administrators. So it's a really cool feature. It's gaining a lot of traction. Um, and pretty much all higher eds, I'm, I'm starting to use that more and more now because, you know, we have HR systems, SIS systems, multiple systems that we have to integrate with. Um, midpoint query language is an axiom based language. It's just a little bit better than using XML filters to do things. So I can do things in plain English, like name contains a dash and look for everyone with a name that contains a dash, or I can look for. Uh, everyone that's linked to a particular resource. So it gives you custom searching options in a, in a very little words as, or, or typing in, in English language. And um, I do it as part of my knowledge share when I onboard new midpoint clients, but I teach a lot of them those things because it gives, the midpoint query language really gives you a lot of ability. And that's only been expanded now in uh, 4.8 and it's pretty much used everywhere. You can use it everywhere. Uh, so it, it's kind of nice. And then there's Ninja upgrades. So Ninja is a command line tool. And if you're using Docker and CICD, you might not be as familiar with it, but there's ways to use it there too. And they've given you way, already Ninja was a way to, you could add objects into midpoint, export objects. You could check your features and make sure that they're compatible, or your, your objects and make sure they're compatible with the new version. Well, they've given you more streamlined ways to do upgrades with Ninja. There's a webinar. I invite people to check it out. Um, um, Grady Bailey at UT Austin highly recommends it. He, he tried it out and was really impressed. Uh, next slide. All right, so some things in midpoint 4.8 when you move up, um, Java 11.17, um, 
or 21 are required. 21, I think, is recommended. Uh, when you do so, just watch your garbage collection. Something I've been, a trend I've been noticing lately in the community has been when people get up to Java about 17. And this is for, true for other apps too, not just Midpoint, but Midpoint's a heavy Heath user, depending on how many identities you have. So it's more apparent. But with the garbage collection changes by default, you might get into situations where you garbage collect pause quite often. That is, let's say this is the classic example, but I, I ran my tasks run at midpoint at night in midpoint. I get in the morning and they're not done. And I and and maybe I can get into my 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 app and look and see and I don't understand it, right? It shouldn't have taken all night. Well, you go to do a top or something, you see all these garbage collections running, and that's slowing things down. So we've seen a lot more instances of that. So do consider when you do upgrade, you may have to look at Shenandoah or ZGC garbage collectors. Those are two uh, new garbage collectors. And this is true of any higher heap um, app that you don't want to pause a world on garbage collection. So um, that's just something to look at. Postgres 16 is now supported and recommended, but you can use all those other versions I have there. Nothing to write home about. Postgres has been working great. Um, it's been reliable, the native repository for Midpoint. So uh, that that's pretty much it. Now, there's a big thing out in the community uh, when it happened. Um, unfortunately, Evolvium is dealing with European regulations. And European regulations, they just passed a law. And we'll see if it's how it's enforced and whether it actually is fully codified throughout the EU. But, but basically, um, even open source uh, software, the people that created are responsible for it. So that means if someone like, let, let's take the, the secure shell vulnerabilities or the log4j vulnerabilities, we've seen a lot of these recently. In those cases, a lot of them are open source projects, they would have been responsible for the security of vulnerability breach. Um, and there's, I think they put some car routes now, if you're not making money off of it, and you're just doing it part of your free time, then you might not not be responsible, but it's still up in the air. And so Evolvium heavily considered their legal team and realized that they need to support the software indefinitely fully. And they already did, but there's actually hard requirements now about that that we don't have here in America. Anyways, they needed funding for this to continue this work and to continue the security um, uh, assurances. And um, also to they're, they're putting together a whole guide on how Midpoint um, matches up against standards like NIST now. NIST came out with their standards. All this takes money, so they... Uh, re require that if you go clustering, you have to buy an Evolvium subscription. Contact us, we'll help you, we'll quote one out, you can buy it through us. Um, and basically, that's just for clustering. So that means if you need more, more than one midpoint node, then you're gonna have to have a, a subscription. Now, this is a good idea anyways, because, because clustering is largely a feature that they're still working on. It's so complex and um, requires a lot of, of, of work to it. So that's another reason why they did this change. Um, I realize it's a lot of churn in the community and a lot of concern, um, but most people, to my experience, that are less than, let's say, 300,000 identities are usually only running two nodes just to be highly available. And you don't need to do that. There's ways you can talk to us, open a ticket. We'll help you uh, run on a single node instance uh, with Midpoint reliably. But uh, if you do need the two uh, uh, nodes or more than one nodes, so let's say you're UT Austin size and you got 10 million identities, um, in that case, you uh, you you would need to buy uh, and, and and they have purchased a, a, a subscription from Evolvium. There's two levels. We'll help you with that, um, and uh, it gives you benefits beyond um, beyond just clustering. So you, you can ask questions, and bug fixes, things like that. So um, open a ticket if you have any questions of that. But if you do move to four eight, note that after four eight two you or four eight two and beyond, you have to if you have two two nodes, it will warn you in the logs, and the other node will essentially not work. Um, unless you you do that. And you just need a subscription ID to put in there. Next slide. Uh, so these are the updates to the connectors. I covered them last time, but there are actually a couple version bumps because they've been making improvements over the 4.8 uh, X series. So um, just check out. I mean, particularly, I always like to be on the latest of database table and that because, you know, those are the most that are widely used. Um, the, the, the kind of ID hasn't changed throughout the 4.0 X series, but there are updates there. All right, next slide. I believe that's it for midpoint. So uh, any questions, put them in the chat or open a ticket and we're happy to help. All right, 
Well, it doesn't look like we have any questions, so we want to thank everybody for attending. This actually was a pretty well attended um, um, webinar for us. And so if you know anybody else and feel like this was valuable, that when we have an, uh, our next IAM briefing will be sometime in 2025, probably around this time frame, since it seems like we get get a better, we've got a better set of uh, more participants um, able to attend at this point in time. So we'll probably be at, at, at the same point in time next year. So thank you everybody for attending and have a good day.